So Chere, you just learned some Roma. Uh, that's Roma for Stararish, or what's working, what are you doing? I know my Bosnian may not be perfect, but uh, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about how I arrived in this great city and uh, what I've learned a little bit working with the Roma. Um, uh, I first actually came into contact with the Roma when I was back in <laughs> California in 2007. My wife and I went to a festival uh, near our town, and uh, there was a guy at the festival, a Roma guy, he had a sign, and it, it, he was carrying it around the whole day, and it said, Evolve Beyond War. And I was like, wow. I took a picture of it. I couldn't find my picture for this presentation, unfortunately. And I was like, hey, there's more to the Roma than I thought about. Um, and we were going around the festival and looking at all the all the things that uh, different people have made and meeting Roma, seeing performances of dance and their culture. And, and uh, I hadn't really thought of much about Roma until I met my wife because she was interested in that. And uh, I was like, wow, Roma, interesting. You know, you can see on their flag they have this wheel from their time many centuries ago when they were traveling from India across through the Iran picking up different pieces of language along the way, all the way into Europe, from maybe the 9th century into 16th century. They're scattered all over Europe, uh, some of the largest uh, Roma communities in Europe are in Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, we also have some in Serbia, and uh, in different areas. Uh, even here in Bosnia we have 10,000, all told worldwide there's something like t an estimated amount of 10 million Roma. Now, Roma don't often identify as Roma, uh, but um, through different researches and DNA, they can be traced that their, a lot of their DNA comes from India originally. Um, this is my wife, Cora Maria, and uh, she kind of <coughs> sets the, the, my discovery of Roma. She first came to Sarajevo in 2000, 2002, 2003 to visit and work with Roma on like a gap year after high school. And she, she fell in love with the Roma. And she decided to go learn Bosnian and Serbian Croatian in Austria. And then she uh, came back in her summers and different times and uh, caught the, a dream. Could she build a preschool for, Mar for Roma? Uh, she saw the plight of the Roma. Uh, you know, the EU calls them, you know, uh, or sorry, the World Bank calls it the, one of the most uh, struggling minorities, largest struggling minority in Eastern Europe. And the, and the, seven, the World Bank also says 70% of Roma families are in deep poverty. Uh, the EU has put many programs together to try to help Roma. Uh, and, they, and they say that to integrate Roma, it's, it's uh, all of our responsibility in the European community. Okay, so some of these things you might not have been aware of about the Roma, uh, they're really, really challenged to, to uh, meet education, health care, and uh, economic needs. They have lots of uh, gaps between them and the rest of normal people. Um, and so I, I was like, wow, maybe I can somehow influence, get involved in this project of, of my wife's. How can I uh, use my business background and support her uh, desire to start this Roman preschool? Um, and so, you know, we came on a visit, like, could, could uh, like a, a businessman from America live in Bosnia? It was a real big question for me, I was actually quite scared. Um, <laughs> we came in April 2008, and we drove to Tuzla, you know, we went on the state road, you know, and it was just like, oh, can we pull over please? <laughs> and, it, and we got to Tuzla, and my wife ran into someone she knew. <laughs> so there was a Roma in, in the center of Tuzla that she knew, and we had a coffee with her. And uh, I was really shocked at how small the community was in, in Bosnia in general, but the Roma community. And I started to gain some, some understanding of their different uh, challenges. I visited some different some settlements in Avratsa, uh, in Dallas Marta, and I started to understand a little bit about the Roma. And towards the end of the week, I was able to give a speech uh, to a Roma group, and a veteran, a lady veteran, uh, translated into Bosnian for me. 
Um, I, I was really passionate about uh, my background, which comes from a mixed race family. I'm African American, Irish, and German. And all through my life, I had uh, not believed the myths and the lies about what could hold me back as an African American or as a, a dark person. And I had always just gone forward and into the abyss. I didn't know what was possible. Um, different, a lot of my family and different people had come from great, great uh, grandson of slaves. You know, my grandfather was on the, on the, in Mississippi going in the backs of places and places where you weren't supposed to be as, a, as an African American or you might get lynched. Uh, and I heard all these stories growing up, um, but I never believed them. I just was like, I'll just ignore everything and try to do what I can do. And I felt like this, uh, this uh, communion with the Roma that like I could show them the way. Maybe I could show them the way. You know, uh, African Americans had come out of their slavery. African Americans had come out of their educational une unequalness. African Americans had uh, found great leaders like Martin Luther King to bridge the gap to the wider community, to bring in the African Americans to the American uh, community. Why couldn't I be the bridge, maybe, for the Roma into the Bosnian community? How could I be a person who made awareness for the Bosnians of Roma? What could I do? And I gave this impassioned speech about Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. It was interesting, we heard about that earlier, uh, to this Roma group, and I was well received. I was surprised. <laughs> They were, they were interested to improve education for their families. They were interested to do things uh, to grab the brass ring, so to speak. And uh, I went away kind of feeling connected that I might have a purpose if I came to Sarajevo. I ended up coming uh, sooner than I thought. I came in September of 2008. And, um, you know, I was at first just overwhelmed, of course, by, by the culture and uh, my language barrier and different things that I had problems just trying to adjust. But I was really uh, uh, impressed to see different uh, positive aspects of the Roma community. I mean, we all have heard the negative aspects. We all know that uh, they're collecting trash to stay alive. Uh, they're uh, maybe begging here or there. We call it panhandling in America, bothering somebody here or there. Um, but uh, what I started to do was to serve the Roma. And that's kind of the point, one of my messages, my main message tonight is, when you serve someone, you learn about yourself. You know, and I overcame this uh, prejudice I had about panhandlers. <laughs> I used to really like wonder about these people who were begging, like, how could you ever do that? Well, if you had a choice to steal or to beg, what would you do? Well, maybe you would choose to steal, but maybe you would choose to beg. And maybe I shouldn't look down on beggars who are taking like a, maybe ethical way out of this dilemma, economic dilemma they had. And I started to understand their dilemma. I, didn't, I, I wasn't showering them with money. <laughs> I didn't really give money. I took them to meals and, and tried to get into a conversation with them. And that's another point I'll make later. Um, <laughs> trying to figure out, were they willing to make the sacrifices and do what it takes <laughs> for the next generation, for their children? Were they willing to... Uh, make some sacrifices like my mother or my father had made to get me to a good high school, to get me to college? Were they willing to take their children to, the way it is here in Bosnia, to school every single day? <laughs> and were they able to help their children or find an after school homework program or find some program to help them really stay in school? What I really felt attractive by my, this is a picture of my daughter, who's the little non-Roma lady in the middle there, <laughs> and me out on one of these sort of serving opportunities. Um, but um, what I was really excited about was telling you about this project we started um, with uh, preschool. My wife had this idea uh, mm -hmm. to start a preschool called Deva Chichabre, or God's Kids, and to really, really just to pour love into kids. She got like a dream that said, hey, if you can uh, affect the first generation, the early generation, uh, you can affect the whole people group. And we, we, at first we weren't sure what to do with this, how should we start this, and she started a mother-child group, and they got a few mother's <laughs> meeting sharing uh, best practices and supporting each other, and then the group grew, and. And then pretty soon you had like 20 kids meeting at, the, at, at a rented uh, 
office space or apartment and every week, and we started to get the formation of a potential for a preschool. Preschool takes three things. It takes uh, the students, the kids, a place that's kind of suitable and safe, and it also takes the workers that really have a heart for children. And so we had the place, we had the children, and now we needed the key component, which is workers. And so my wife went about creating a, she had gone to school in the United States, that's how we met. She was there getting her preschool degree and taught preschool for a year and a half in an in, uh, inner city area in San Francisco, near San Francisco. And so she had some experience uh, with the curriculums and with the early childhood education. And she started to put a training program together for some Roma that were interested to work at the preschool. And so it was really great that uh, we had the ability uh, to receive over a three-year period about 18 kids in total, 15 who regularly attended the program, with about eight kids who ended up uh, going on and are still in school today. And what was really, I mean, of course, there were lots of ups and downs and lots of things happening, but really it was about preparing those kids and those families for the daily grind of getting your kid to school. I mean, I'm a parent of three kids, and it's not, it's not all it's cracked up to be. You really have to motivate your kids to go to school. You really have to get there on time. You, all these things you have to do. And if you're not, if that wasn't your upbringing, you don't really have the tools or the motivation for that. So it's, it's very interesting to see that we found a small percentage of the Roma community that was interested in that and uh, got them motivated in, and uh, the kids were coming in for the curriculum. The curriculum was just mostly fun activities. The main attraction was the warm meal. <laughs> and of course, getting on a regular schedule, learning grooming habits, learning all kinds of uh, things about timing and clocks and, and all the things that we're all raised with that are normal for us, but for Roma, it's not. It's, it, I have a very special and complimentary term called uh, Roma Bremena. <laughs> and everything happens when it happens. It doesn't happen on a specific time schedule. But they have a piece for that. There's a piece that comes with that. And I learned a lot from the Roma. I learned by serving. I was serving the Roma, and I was learning about myself. Um, a real big benefit that we didn't understand was the three Roma workers that were working at our preschool. Um, they, we hired and trained Roma workers, and then uh, we saw them develop. They gained uh, skills. They started having job offers outside of the school. Uh, they were happy giving back to their community. They were interested in uh, the development of the children, and you know they gained valuable experience. In terms of what I did, of course, I was just the partner tagged along to Bot Sarajevo <laughs> for my wife's dream. But I was the administrator of the NGO. I was. Uh, uh, make sure the employees got paid on time. I was going to the accountant, filing the papers, making sure everything was above, was above board or on the NGO and signing the contracts with the employees and thinking about things and talking with my wife about leadership, op leadership issues in the, in the preschool. Um, it's a lot, it was a lot about just going the extra mile to make those employees feel really uh, appreciated. <laughs> and when I was serving others, I learned a lot about myself. I learned uh, how hard it is to maintain a preschool. And after about three years, uh, our two pre preschool leaders uh, had more kids. My wife had their third child, and the other preschool co-teacher had her third child, and we were missing one component that we needed at the preschool, which was the workers. Uh, we had uh, a final graduation party. I think we had two or three uh, graduation parties while we were there, and barbecues, and we ended up just putting the, sh the curriculum on the shelf, and we're waiting now for our next opportunity to reopen the preschool. Um, the other, so I think really what out of all that I learned was we touched the parents a lot. We, the, the kids, the, I mean, in terms of our commitment to their children, trying to pour into them, we had some quotes from Bosnians like, I didn't recognize that kid before, and now I know who he is, and he's well behaved, and lots of interesting feedback. Um, and uh, I, I met a really, a new friend. I had this friend. His name's Yasmin. He was one of the co-teachers. And uh, here's the picture. Some pictures of the preschool. They're a little dark, so it's hard to see. Um, but it's like a typical preschool. Kids doing lots of arts and crafts and stuff. And my daughter's in the picture there. Of course, she was going to the preschool. She's now eight. Um, but here's my friend Yasmin. He, he told me I could use his Facebook page photo. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about him because uh, I'm proud to call Yasmin my friend. Uh, what can I say about him? He's a child of the war. 
You know, he left Bosnia during the war with his parents. They took him to Germany and his, his uh, two brother, his brother and two sisters. And, uh, you know, he learned German. He started playing soccer over there. Then the war ended and they came back. Of course, when they came back, somebody was in their house, so they had to battle for their house, get, like, get some court orders, get some people out of the house. Uh, but while he grew up in Bosnia, he was a talented soccer player and he got drafted into the soccer uh, club Gelio. Uh, before he could make his great debut, of course, he injured himself, but he decided to start college uh, and he started at the University of Sarajevo in criminology. And uh, he's right now at his last step writing his thesis. He finished his uh, last test, I think, this, this semester. And he's just about, he's asking now, how, uh, what's that, how does that look? What's the thesis? He wrote some papers, he wrote some things, but he never wrote a big thesis. So I'm, I've been c coaching him from time to time or asking him what his motivation for his education is. And I've been really impressed by his uh, persistence to get through that. Um, I, I'm really hanging out with him a lot, mostly because my wife and his wife are best friends. And I have a real interesting story about how actually we became friends. Um, we had some disagreements. Um, we raise our kids different. Our kids are always playing together. Um, one time, I, was, we, we ate I ate dinner at his house once a week for three years in a row. And uh, one of those times, uh, his son picked up a toy gun and pointed it at my daughter's face. And I got really scared and I grabbed it. Of course, the Esmin was right there. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's Roma. We all live, I mean, we're living in this not such big places and everybody's in the same room. And I didn't think of any, anything of the incident. I was just reacting as a father would, protecting his daughter. And a couple of days, a couple of weeks later, yeah, he came up to me and he said, You know, why didn't you ask me about that? Why didn't you ask me about uh, what my son was doing. I could have handled that instead of you. And it seemed like we were coming to a conversa confrontation. And I, you know, I, I didn't know what exactly to do. The blood started to raise up a little bit in me, and I was kind of like, uh, I was just reacting to what your son did. Defending, and I was defending my daughter. And we were going back and forth a little bit a couple of times, and I started to step back and get to the balcony a little bit back and see what was going on in the situation. I was there, but my Spirit was outside of, and seeing, and I saw, hey, I was wrong. He has an objection to how I handle the situation. I should just apologize and come down off my high horse. But I know how better to deal with the situation than he did. I'm in his house. I'm taking, away from his dog, uh, I'm taking something away from his son. And he's right there. I should have asked him. I said, yeah, you're right. I should have asked you. And in that moment, the situation diffused. And from that time on, Yasmin and I became friends. Before that, I don't think Yasmin could really communicate with me so well, or we didn't really have a relationship. But after that, our relationship started to grow. And actually, I, I was already listening a lot to him and thinking a lot about things he had to say. Uh, and, but now he started to take some of the input from me, which was interesting. And now we started to like build up our friendship and build up our relationship. And that was really interesting for me. Uh, at, I don't know, it might not be so familiar, but as a foreigner in a foreign land, it's very hard to make close friends. Because most people think you'll just be here for a year or two or three, and then you go. Well, I've been here almost nine years now, so uh, maybe I'm a little bit different. But it was really great to, to hear about, to see Yasmin <coughs> and his growth and how his family's been growing. He's got three kids. And, and see how he's stewarding his family to see how he's leading his family and to learn and to see his commitment and persistence to pursue his education and change his family for the better for the future. Uh, his son and my, my daughter are in the same class in third grade here in, the, in Peyton and in the, the local schools. And uh, it's, it's really a, a benefit to have friends like that. And uh, so I, as I was working with Roma, I learned something about myself and I grew. And I'm really thankful that I really got involved. And so what am I asking you to do today? I'm going to ask you to do something. Next time, you might go by a <coughs> Roma who's begging for something. Talk, stop to, for a second and talk to them. Find out their name. Figure out what's going on in their life. Take them for a coffee or a meal. See what they, uh, what's happening for them. And if there's any advice you can give them or there's any encouragement you can give them. Maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to have an impact 
on their life, and maybe uh, your act of kindness will encourage them in the next step of their life. I think we're all part of the same human family, uh, and if one part of us is struggling, then it could affect all of us. So I think if we help others to be included and to get healthy and to grow, it'll be better for all of us in the end. Thanks very much.